Good afternoon, WCN friends. It's great to be here today. It's been over a year since the start of a pandemic that changed our lives forever. Amid the pain and the loss, in this time we also learned that our health and the health of the environment are closely connected. And health has been at the center of our work with the Ethiopian World Conservation Program for many years. In protecting Ethiopian walls against diseases, we have learned that the only sustainable solution is one that simultaneously addresses the health of the walls, the health of the communities and their domestic livestock, and the health of the mountains that sustain, sustain them all. And so this is the topic of my presentation today. And this is important. Let's consider COVID-19, a coronavirus that existed in wildlife, most likely bats, infected humans and evolved, and the new disease spread very quickly along across the world. And like many emerging diseases, its origin can be tracked to an increasing proximity between people and wildlife as we encroach into natural habitats and move live animals for consumption or trade. And disease is similarly a, a virus that exists in the domestic dog population. It infects and kills humans and livestock and it spills over into wildlife. Today, disease and canine distemper are the main threats to the survival of Ethiopian wolves and other endangered carnivores such as the African wild dog. And with agriculture encroaching and domestic dogs populations increasing, this threat is here to stay. And for that reason, the One Health approach is becoming increasingly important in conservation. It takes into account the overlapping needs of human animals and environmental health, and it calls for an integrated approach across sectors with benefits for everyone. For that reason, our work focuses on the pastoral communities that own the livestock and the domestic dogs and suffer themselves from the impact of rabies. Some of their dogs are allowed to roam freely at daytime when they encounter wolves and can pass on diseases. While domestic, uh, while Ethiopian wolves can coexist with people, their exposure to these diseases are a main problem. And the Ethiopian wolves live in these mountains and in every, anywhere else. They became a specialized rodent hunters and they spent hours hunting and perfecting techniques. This is called short tail and he's trying a digging and pull method without much success. And while they need to be alone to hunt, Ethiopian wolves are highly social. They live in family groups of up to 15 individuals. The dominant pair has a litter of pups every year and the subordinate wolves will help raising the pups and babysitting. This is our well-known Tarura pack during a morning greeting session before they set off to patrol the park, the territory boundaries. And because they are highly social and live at high densities, when diseases come into the system, it can spread fast like fire. So our One Health approach to this problem is holistic. One of the main components is to be always alert. And this is done by a team of highly trained monitors that walk in or in horseback and with binoculars, they keep an eye on many wolf families throughout the year. They will detect carcasses very on, early on on an outbreak and will extract samples for diagnosis. The other key component is engaging people. From raising awareness of the risk of diseases up to engaging them actively in conservation. And we do this with children at school and during community meetings and also going house by house in the remote highlands, engaging in long conversations with them. Today, people willingly bring their dogs to us for vaccination, like these boys in the Valley Mountains, but it's only the result of many years of tenacious work. By vaccinating domestic dogs, we keep the disease at low levels in the reservoir population. And this brings also benefits for people we vaccinated dogs against rabies and more recently against canine distemper at a rate of around 4,000 dogs a year. 
And in these areas, we see fewer cases of rabies in people and livestock, and also people are positive about the children's wolf conservation. And we keep very detailed records of the animals vaccinated and about the dog population, because it's important to be able to assess the scale of the task. For any vaccination program to be successful, we need to reach and maintain 17% coverage. And this is almost really impossible. So sometimes, rabies and distemper affects the wolves. And when this happens, we vaccinated packs around the focus of the infection to stop their break from progressing further. By then, however, many wolf lives might be lost. So oral vaccination can be the holy grail for Ethiopian wolf conservation. By eating a meat bait with a sachet inside, this wolf is self-vaccinating. Oral vaccinations are cheaper, less intrusive, and can be done preventively. So there are many lessons that we have learned through time. And one is that every new wolf vaccinated, that animal will count. And let's go back to Tarura as a good example of this. We know this back from 2010, when a young female settled a new territory near our camp. We call her Tarura O2, and we recognize her by the red uh, um, mark on the right ear. This pack was vaccinated in 2014 and 2017 again. Tarura O2 has been a dominant female since then. She has bred every year, up giving uh, birth to more than 50 pups and survived three episodes. In 2016, when the Tarura pack was very large, it has split up to give rise to the Hangafo pack. And this year, a daughter of hers is repeating history. She created the Fatima pack, and now it has having a healthy litter, which is contributing to the recovery of this population that was devastated in the last outbreak in 2020. And the premise that every animal count is nowhere more important than in the northern highlands of Ethiopia. Because Ethiopian wolves live in a small population, even a new population has only one pack. So Gilma Eshet is going to tell us a bit more about the semi wolf population and about a wolf that survived against the odds. Thank you. My name is Gilma Eshet. I'm working for Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program as Amara Region Coordinator. In Amara Region, in the northern highlands of Ethiopia, there are six isolated wolf habitats. Simeon Mountain National Park is one of the largest wolf habitats in the region and even the third largest habitat in the country next to Bali in the RC Mountains National Park. Uh, Simen Mountain National Park contains the highest mountain peaks called Ras Dejel uh, and uh, harbors, in addition to Ethiopian wolf, other uh, endemic large mammals such as Wale Ibex, Chalada Babon, uh, Starkus Hairs, and many more other endemic small mammals. As you see, Simen Mountain National Park has a scenic beauty landscape and therefore it is one of the highly visited tourist destination in the country and also it is one of the world natural heritage site inscribed by UNESCO. It is honor and the great privilege of me introducing one of my field teams working here to share you their wolf conservation story in these beautiful landscapes. Last year an injured wolf from one of our focal pack, Ainameda, found under, under a small bridge. It was shot by a bullet and one of its hind leg was totally broken. And after that, we handled and transported it to the nearest outpost, Ainameda, and Ethiopian of Conservation Program did a labor, a labor race care and uh, treatment in this outpost for 50 days. In the first couple of days, it has been, it had been in its natal family. And after that, for two weeks, it has been traveling a lot crossing different park boundaries and habitats. And after that, 
it was settled and has got a very nice habitat or settled in Shahano, where recently or after six months loneliness has got a female Ethiopian wolf in that habitat. Now he's enjoying his life with her. It is, we are also very glad because we have been really, we have been really stressed, stressed by his loneliness. Terefe was rescued in the middle of a pandemic and Terefe's story is a story of resilience and perseverance. And perseverance is at the core of the lessons that we have learned over the years. One of them is that there are no simple fixes. All one health tools are necessary. And this implies really long-term commitment on everyone involved. And also continued research. Research has been key to developing and testing all our interventions. And let's move into the third diagram in this One Health approach. And this is environmental health, because there won't be future for the world or people without healthy ecosystems. And for that, we have started the biodiversity-friendly future. This project implements three alternative light routes, and they aim at restoring habitats by helping financially the communities and even the health of communities, particularly women. So Fekalo Lema is going to tell us a bit more about this project. Biodiversity-friendly future, building a future where people and wildlife coexist sharing the costs and benefit of conservation. We help developing biodiversity friendly future for the Afro-Alpine communities in two ways. By supporting new protected areas to realize their conservation goals and by creating opportunities for more sustainable livelihoods in the highland. As you see, since 2015, Ethiopia Wolf Conservation Program support local communities establish micro enterprise to produce and commercialize fuel saving stove, highland honey, and planting native festuka grass in Amharic Guasa, involving community leader, local and regional government at all stage. As a result, Community benefits financially, but also the environment, because pressure upon natural resources decline as people need less firewood for cooking. They harvest guasa in their own plot rather than in the wild and protected Erika forest source of the famous highland honey. I am so excited to introduce you today, my colleagues, Ms. Raksiyum, who talks to you more about honey production. Beekeeping is an agricultural activity which gives you high income return to the small investment amount you spend. For generations, the communities in the highlands of Ethiopia have the tradition of producing highland honey. The flora diversity in this mountainous part of Ethiopia creates beekeeping opportunities to these highland producers. These highland producers produce the most organic, pure, healthy, and unadulterated honey that everyone loves to have at his table. The Highland communities have strong customary resource management laws. So with little help and support to them, these benefits of beekeeping can be maintained in a sustainable way and for long. Thank you very much. I'm a fan of the Biodiversity Friendly Futures Project and we're raising to the challenge of scaling up and making it sustainable. I invite you to join the EWCP family on the challenges we have ahead. 
we need to secure the One Health core annual costs, and we need to engage political support so that it can be implemented, as well as more partnership across sectors so we can vaccinate more domestic dose in more areas. And we need new research, particularly about can I distemper because this is a complex disease. And last but not least, we want to build internal capacity so that the conservation of Ethiopians can persist and is sustainable. It is because this fantastic group of conservationists that Ethiopians will have a future. So in their name and in the name of the rules, I want to say a big thank you to you and thank you for listening today.